This is Duke University. The happiest woman like the happiest nation has no history, as George Eliot writes in The Mill on the Floss. I have also published essays and reviews on feminist and Victorian topics. In my current work, I continue to think about grief, especially in relation to the field of disability studies, which has understandably focused on exploring so-called disabilities as welcome variants of human potentiality. Our second speaker, Dr. Colby Emerson Reed, is currently the Chair of Fashion Studies at Columbia College in Chicago. She formerly was the Director of the Consumer Innovation Collaborative and Interdisciplinary Research Partnership at North Carolina State University in Raleigh. She edited the book Design, Mediation, and the Posthuman, published in 2014, and was a contributor to Emerging Genres in New Media Environments, published in 2016. Reed is currently working on two co authored book projects, Post-Human Television and Fallen Angel, The Consumption of Religion in American Cocktail Culture. So you should check out her at the reception over cocktails. <laughs> and our third presenter, Cristobal Silva, is an associate professor in the Department of English and Contemporary Literature at Columbia University and an editor of the book The 18th Century Theory and Interpretation. He is the author of Miraculous Plagues, an Epidemiology of Early New England Narrative, published on Oxford in 2011, and has recently, recently co-edited a special issue of Early American Literature on Disability Studies with Sari Altschuler. Sorry if I got the name incorrectly. His current work is a study of late 18th century medicine and the slave trade. So we have a fabulous panel head, head up for you on health, loss, and the biopolitical distribution of affect. And we'll start with Christina. Thank you very much and thanks to everybody here at Duke that, who has managed to put together and, and carry off quite a complex and interesting conference. So thank you for inviting me. Um, in this paper, I argue that remembering what is irretrievably lost and sustaining the harrowing of grief can prepare the ground on which to build a transformative future. I'm working on melancholy, not as a depressive detachment, but a potentially creative response to overwhelming loss. In, the, in my work, I explore loss in the context of disability studies, a field that takes what is called the social model as axiomatic. The social model tells us that disability is not inherent to a body, but created by social norms, a discipline harmful to non-normative bodies. This axiom has left little room to explore disabling incapacity as an active grief. By contrast, in their book, The Politics of Mourning, lost the politics of mourning, David Eng and David Kazanjian write that loss is inseparable from what remains, for what is lost is known only by what remains of it, how those remains are produced, read, and sustained. My writing is a deeply melancholic grappling with what remains of the body, that I'd been for 50 years before I broke my neck in a cycling accident, for spinal cord injury has transformed my body, breath, and voice, and radically, dis or dis dis radically disordered my sense of self. I've been reading the work of Walter Benjamin, a famously melancholic German-Jewish writer who died fleeing the Nazi army as it advanced on Paris. His last complete piece was published in English under two titles, Theses on the Philosophy of History and On the Concept of History. In paragraph number four, he famously describes an oil transfer print by Clay that biographers tell us was one of his most valued possessions, and this image that you see behind me 
is uh, of that oil transfer print. And this is what Benjamin had to say about it. There is a painting by Clay called Angelus Novus. An angel is depicted there who looks as though he were about to distance himself from something that he is staring at. His eyes are wide open, his mouth stands open, and his arms are outstretched. The angel of history must look just so. His face is turned toward the past. Where we see the appearance of a chain of events, he sees one single catastrophe, which will unceasingly pile rubble on top of rubble and hurl it before his feet. A storm drives, drives him irresistibly into the future to which his back is turned while the rubble heap before him grows sky high. That which we call progress is this storm. For the longest time, I couldn't figure out why the angel was facing backwards while being blown forward by the storm of progress. It began to make sense in relation to what Benjamin says of those who are gone. Not even the dead will be safe from the enemy if he is victorious, and this enemy has not ceased to be victorious. To look forward and imagine the time of history to be consonant with progress consigns this past to a fixed trajectory that by, ne that by necessity must lead to today. And historical inevitability always favors the victors. History imagined as progress must lose sight of the openness of the past. The fact that no fated necessity brought us necessarily to the present moment. The victorious ones wish us to think differently and to admit that the vanquished were defeated in the march of progress. Their time is over and done, and a brighter future awaits us. I come to explore the wreck. The words are purposes. The words are maps. I came to see the damage that was done and the treasures that prevail. When I write as elsewhere of diving into the wreck of my body, I'm silently citing Adrian Rich's necessary poem, Diving Into the Wreck. I considered that my words, too, were purposes as I mapped the wreckage of a body I no longer recognized and could no longer love. Her poetic language and intelligence calls us to honor the dead and salvage what we can from what lies on the ocean floor. The drowned face, always staring toward the sun, the evidence of damage, worn by the salt and sway into this threadbare beauty, the ribs of the disaster, curving their assertion among the tentative haunters. No historical inevitability brought fascism to power in the 20th century Europe, and no necessity oversees the disasters of the 21st. Necessity is not the consort of history. Yet Benjamin and Rich know that absence shapes what is present, as do Eng and Kazanjian. Grief abides in both public and private life. This is a powerful truth, whether you are thinking about the lives of many or the life of one. As Benjamin writes, what is lost and gone is never something purely individual. There is, as Aang and Kazanjian's book asserts, a politics of grief. I see bodies caught up by the maelstrom of, so of so-called the maelstrom of so-called progress and cast down on the pile of rubble growing ever higher at the feet of the angel of history. A forensic exactitude of description is needed 
to keep faith with the bones. My melancholic account of grief and disability is but one of many in the politics of grief. In her book, The Melancholy of Race, Psychoanalysis, Assimilation, and Hidden Grief, Anne Anne Lin Chang argues that America is affected by a mood created by the disregard for an active forgetting of black bodies passed forward from chattel slavery on. The enormity of slavery and its aftermath beggars description and haunts every effort that declares it to be a past anomaly long since overcome by the modernizing forces of democratic, conclu democratic inclusion. Benjamin writes, to articulate what is past does not mean to recognize how it really was. It means to take control of a memory as it flashes in a moment of danger. It is a question of holding fast to a picture of the past, just as if it had unexpectedly thrust itself in a moment of danger on the historical subject. Beloved, a novel is such a response. It holds fast to a picture of the past as Toni Morrison illuminates the 1856 actions of the modern Medea, a fugitive slave named Mar Margaret Garner, to represent the unspeakable thoughts unspoken. For every effort must be made to save the dead from the narrative of history as progress. Otherwise, they will be lost twice over. Black men and women held in slavery were clearly understood to be both human beings capable of reasoned decision and chattel property. Sadia Hartman has shown that the humanity of slaves was acknowledged most decisively in the moment of punishment. They were punished for any act that demonstrated the exercise of an autonomous will, that decisive enlightenment measure of civilized man. One of the cases Hartman discusses is that of Cecilia, a slave who murdered the man who bought her, raped her on the day of, per on the day of purchase, and did not stop until four years later when she killed him in her cabin before he could rape her once again, once again. Hartman explains that since slaves were property and moreover, because black women were said by whites to enjoy a bestial lascivious sexuality, black women could not be raped. Murder, however, was the willful act of an autonomous subject condemned as a murderer who, with premeditation, took a life that was not hers to take, Cecilia's sentence to hang recognizes her humanity so as to put her to death. How can her bones be honored? Toni Morrison brings this question to Beloved. There are the affects wrought of the disciplining of black bodies through sexual violence are the warp and weft of the text, brought alive by the overlaying, overlayering of chronology, the complex indirection of metaphor, and the voice of the narrator in relation to those of the characters and the terrible truth this narrative discourse tells. Setha is a fugitive who, slaped, who escaped slavery with her children after surviving a brutal rape, witnessing it has immobilized her husband, another slave with a disabling horror that is figured as mentally incapacitating. Tracked down by the slave catchers, Seth succeeds in killing her month-old daughter to save her from the terrors of slavery and is trying to kill her sons when she is taken. Beloved 
the character who gives her name to the novel is the ghost of the, of the murdered daughter, which is to say she's a metaphor carrying from the underworld to Morrison's historical fiction, infernal and quite literally unspeakable truths unspoken, which the novel approaches through melancholy indirection. You got two feet, Setha, not four, Setha's lover Paul D. says to her when he learns what she has done. And then, right then, a forest sprang up between them, tactless and quiet. Who could render judgment in this case? Columbia University law professor Patricia Williams analyzes the sometimes paralyzing contradictions of being black, a woman, and graduate of Harvard Law, who now teaches contract law. She has at hand the 1850 contract of sale drawn up when her great-great-grandmother was 11 and the object of property being sold. Williams takes control of that memory as it flashes in a moment of danger. For the past lives of black people held in slavery are always in danger of being forgotten. The prominent white lawyer who purchased her mother, three generations removed, took her home and raped her. She bore a daughter, Mary, and from that rapist descends the maternal line of the Williams family. Williams declares that the contract and all that it entails puts her in the situation described by Marguerite Duras. We are united in a fundamental shame at having to live. It's here we are at the heart of our common fate, the fact that we are our mother's children, the children of a candid creature murdered by society. We are on the side of society which has reduced her to despair. Because of what has been done to our mother, so amiable, so trusting, we hate life, we hate ourselves. Self-hatred is a melancholy affect, a mood driven by tenacious attachment to a lost body. In Morrison's body, that lost yet incorporated body is actualized in beloved. Morrison insists that her incorporation is simultaneously Seth's fantasy and a touchable presence that others can feel. Morrison knows with the genius of her extraordinary creativity that the terrible past of slavery and its embodied horrors must be steadily regarded despite the dangers of bringing back the dead. Williams declares her despair on being on the side of society for the melancholy of race is simultaneously a state of mind that she represents and Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to cut as I'm reading. Uh, I'm going to simply go ahead. In describing the ontological condition of human being, Heidegger observes that you are born into whatever is the prevailing mood of your time. Mood is not an idea about any one thing, but the affect of a given world that you feel along your nerves. Jonathan Flatley urges critical thinkers to take seriously the ways in which being human engages sense and sensation simultaneously without being able to disengage one from the other. You think and feel together with others. This is a truth that contravenes the assumption that human beings are distinguished by our capacity for self-sovereignty and reasoned judgment. Morrison's 1987 grief-stricken novel calls a murdered child from her grave. Trayvon Martin is alive yet because his 2012 death at the hands of a white vigilante sparked the organization of Black Lives Matter.
a grassroots commitment to rebuilding the black liberation movement. This is a politics of irremediable grief and racial melancholy. Benjamin's angel faces backward toward the past, even as he is swept away into the future. Only if we reckon what has been lost can we go forward unself-deceived. Hurried along by the storm called progress, we can blunt its force by asking how history and progress came to be shackled together in the first place. We must take up objects and ideas that are the cast-off of history's triumphal progress, as Benjamin did. The rags, the refuse, this I will not inventory but allow in the only way possible to come into their own by making use of them. Make use of what remains. I believe this is exactly what Jose Munoz argues in his book about queer futures and the queer promise of a time that has that remains yet to come. We see in these works the active and effective work of the humanities, which make and take up art. The work of literature is endless and indispensable because language offers, indeed demands, complexity in the face of belligerent stupidity and quietly strategic forgetfulness. Body, breath, and voice are held in language. I'm glad I was an English major in college and a reader all my life because I needed everything I'd ever read to live on after catastrophic injury into an uncertain and underdetermined future and to account for that living on. I have learned that the feeling of chronic pain or the temporal dislocations of grief can prepare the ground on which to build a transformative future. Loss is inseparable from what remains. So says the bumper sticker of political melancholy. The past inheres in the present, but does not determine it. And every day opens to the future that we make together. Thanks very much. I'm Colby Reed. Um, so I am the person that Nicole introduced as being the chair of fashion studies at Columbia College Chicago. Um, my position there is uh, a, a fairly recent development. I, I've been there all of six weeks, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty green um, in that role. And um, I was thinking as I was preparing for this talk um, about my first freshman convocation in that position when I met the incoming class and kind of wanted to um, set a mood and a, a tone um, for them in their um, upcoming four-ish years of future study. And one of the things um, that I thought about um, as I moved into this uh, position in the department, which is an interdisciplinary department that incorporates people with backgrounds in fashion design, uh, merchandising, all walks of business, um, uh, and the humanities like myself, um, was how in the, this notion that in recent years, I think that fashion is kind of moving from peripheral, ornamental, kind of marginal um, spaces in our culture into a kind of center um, in what I find to be a really interesting way. And so I, I made the case at this freshman convocation um, that we were kind of witnessing right now a watershed moment in fashion, a kind of historic moment um, in, which, in which many of the major cultural issues of our time um, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of being worked out, thought about, and actually kind of crafted, literally made with the hand um, uh, in, 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 in traditionally fashion spaces. And so what I'm, I'm thinking about um, specifically when I say that is the idea of um, fashion kind of moving from space of ornament to um, the space of high technology. Um, so specifically, of course, um, I'm thinking of wearable technology and the extent to which 
we are witnessing um, designers and uh, software, can you see it okay? <laughs> um, software developers um, uh, working through the problem of what it means for the computer to be conceived or the computer network to be, be conceived, it's wires, um, literally, to be conceived as um, these like fine enough filaments and threads that they can be woven together um, into textiles. And so um, in, in uh, uh, wearable technology, some of the most kind of interesting developments are developments in which um, one can actually weave undergarments that are um, very sophisticated computers that we can literally wear as our computers have moved from lab and hospital and office and kind of generally public spaces um, into um, our desks, onto our laps, into the palms of our hands, um, onto our skin, and, um, and ultimately an increasing number of numbers of cases right inside us. Um, so the, the image that you're looking at um, here is an actual um, design of a dress of um, sewn together um, uh, silicon uh, computer boards um, that can be played like a musical instrument on the body. Um, and this, this idea that not only, um, I want to emphasize this idea that not only is fashion kind of moving into the space of high technology and in some ways is becoming indistinguishable from high technology, but I also um, want to emphasize the extent to which um, that also means that fashion is becoming a kind of medical discourse, or that it's making its way into um, the sphere of medicine. Um, so there are a number of examples of um, of this uh, particular movement. The one that you're looking at right now is an example of um, a, uh, a, a, a miniature computer network that's been printed on um, silicon paper that can be um, laid onto the surface of the human brain and um, ultimately will dissolve. And um, this work has been done with silicon and with all kinds of different innovative textile fibers. Um, uh, but it's also been done with natural fibers. Um, so there's a, a lab at Tufts, at, <clears throat> excuse me, at Tufts that is looking um, specifically at the ability of silk to interface with um, virtually all of the tissues of the human body, including um, the brain. And so um, this is a kind of uh, overlaying um, of the computer onto an organ um, that doesn't necessarily require an innovative textile, um, but can use traditional um, natural fibers as well. Um, oops. Now, um, this, this idea of um, what it means for fashion to move into these other spaces that it um, most like distinctly traditionally has not been a part of. Um, there are many very high tech examples um, that we, we could look at and kind of linger on. Um, but for the purposes of today, I, I want to take our attention to something that is a little more lo-fi, um, low-tech. And, um, and, and, and in particular, I'm thinking um, of a, a number of examples from Ray Kawakubo's 1997 uh, Comme des Garçons collection um, that has garnered a number of nicknames um, since its launch in 97, um, including the Quasimodo collection, uh, the Lumps and Bumps collection, and the Tumor um, collection, amongst these a number of others. And um, so when I'm talking about fashion as medicine and thinking about fashion as medicine, um, I, I can't help uh, but think about a collection such as this one, um, when the the thinking and the um, uh, the experiment, the innovation is really focused around um, uh, uh, soft traditional 
fibers um, that have been uh, reimagined by a designer rather than a software or hardware developer. Um, and one of the things that I particularly um, love about and I'm fascinated by in this collection is, um, is the kind of use of fibers like silk um, and then uh, patterns like gingham to explore um, what I would want to suggest today is um, this question of like how can uh, how can a tumor be reimagined by um, different uh, by, by fashion design like what new way of thinking about um, uh, uh, about illness, about a form of sickness and the physical manifestation of sickness on the skin or surface of the body, um, how can fashion kind of reconceive and reconfigure what it means um, to have such a condition or ent um, 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 uh, 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 entity in or on the body. Um, and I particularly like the examples. Um, there are a number of fibers in which Kawakubo um, explores this idea, but I particularly like the examples um, that experiment with gingham um, because I think these are um, asking us to think about the body as um, sofa, right? Um, uh, the, the, the gingham pattern is a pattern that we may be most associated with very intimate um, usually feminized domestic spaces um, that we might associate with kind of curtains in a kitchen um, uh, or with a pattern um, that a, a, a comfy um, a sofa or armchair uh, might be upholstered in. And um, I, th I think this I idea of kind of exploring um, taking something that typically operates in the sphere of discomfort and, um, and uh, uh, kind of... Um, uh, a kind of uh, unnatural aberration of the biological body and um, recalling instead something comfortable, cozy, um, homely, like in the British sense, as opposed to the American sense, um, that we might feel, you know, like how does, what's the touch, what's the feel on one's skin of a shape or a fabric like this? And when, when you look at these kind of tumored, gingham upholstered bodies in the collection, suddenly the register moves from one of shock, dis discomfort, um, a, a kind of focus on the biological symptoms of the feature, and I would argue instead to the touch or the feel of something that looks to be um, quite soft, quite cozy, um, the sort of thing that you might kind of fold yourself um, happily into. Um, and so, so as I've begun to think about um, what fashion has to offer medicine, and specifically what fashion design has to offer medicine, and perhaps even more narrowly and specifically, the question of um, is there such a thing as um, design thinking in medicine um, in, in, the, in the treatment space, and if there is, what would that look like? Um, I, I wanted to, to, to focus less on the, the, the kind of innovative medical textiles and woven uh, wire fibers that we um, might overlay on ourselves, and instead um, something much more rooted in the kind of meat and potatoes of um, fashion, that is the notion of style. Like, what, what is style? And, it, it seems bizarre to, bizarre to say it or to even ask it, but what might, what is this thing we call style and what might it have to offer um, in treatment, uh, medical treatment spaces? Now, as it turns out, there are a number of uh, very interesting and very contemporary examples to, to think about when pursuing this question. Um, but, and I'll show you another one of them um, towards the end of my presentation. Um, but uh, what's been interesting to me is to kind of um, move back in history to look at moments when, um, uh, when the this, this same way of thinking has um, perhaps been used as a course of medical treatment. Like, can we find historical examples of what feels in our biological paradigm today, 
bizarre, discordant um, even to the query. Um, and so the space that I've um, uh, most looked at um, is this space of text, uh, textile and tile design. Um, and I, I come to this question kind of thinking about like, um, what can we do, like, if the most, quint if the quintessence, quintessence, quintessence of style is, um, is shape, is kind of pure form, is, um, uh, is, is pattern, um, then perhaps by looking at the history of pattern development and, and pattern design, um, we can find examples in which um, designers have kind of put their toe into the space um, typically reserved for doctors, for physicians, for surgeons. Um, and so the specific pattern um, that I found most fruitful is a pattern that um, you may recognize, whose name you may recognize, because it, is, because it is the etymological origin of the word grotesque. Um, the, gr the grotesque, that, that word kind of etymologically developed in um, the 19th century uh, uh, at the same time that bi the biological paradigm was kind of pressing out other paradigms for thinking about the human body, about nature, and about the relationship between the two of them. Um, but before that, the, the, the kind of root um, of grotesque was the Italian word grotesque. Um, grotesque uh, 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 is a word that was coined in the Renaissance um, in Italy in the 15th century at the point of the rediscovery um, by the Italians in Rome of Nero's Domus Aria, um, on which Nero's interior decorator, uh, who coincidentally had the name Fabulous, which I think is a, a fun historical <laughs> coincidence. Uh, I, I looked for some kind of etymological relationship between that name and the word fabulous and not found it. Um, uh, it seems like it ought to be there. <laughs> um, so this is a, a, a relief of uh, Domus Aria. Um, and what you can see that's distinct about Grotesky is its ability to take fragments of human, um, animal, and other natural bodies, plant matter, um, uh, uh, minerals, you know, stones, flowers, whatever, um, and not to see them as formally distinct, but to see them as um, items that kind of can merge and blend into each other. Um, and in the Italian Renaissance, this pattern kind of sh sparked a um, a, a major design trend. This was kind of the, um, uh, the, the, the chic pattern, if you will, of um, the Italian Renaissance. Um, and other associations with that pattern I wanted to show you um, are uh, uh, kind of images of the dis disfigured, um, though it doesn't really make sense in this framework, um, female body, like armless, legless, um, we might say disabled female body. Um, and then this larger picture over to your right is um, from a, a, an English um, uh, Renaissance uh, saddle, uh, 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 in, not engraving, but embroidery. Um, so this kind of like monstrous figure, um, all of which I think so interestingly in the paradigm of biology are figured as grotesque, right, um, aberrant, but in the paradigm of design, which is an inorganic paradigm, um, are figured as um, grotesque, uh, stylish, um, chic, right, desirable. Um, and so this kind of um, begs the question uh, for me of, um, well, can this, this textile pattern and this, this, um, this, this form of design thinking, which is not a methodo methodological design thinking, which is how design thinking is often treated, um, but a, a kind of content focused form of design thinking, like, can it actually be used in treatment spaces? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna close, um, gonna, so this is, this is playing, this video is playing um, while I, I, I um, finish my comments. Um, so this is actually Bradley Cooper, the two-time People magazine, magazine Sexiest Man Alive, playing uh, John Merrick, the, um, the elephant man, one of the most kind of famously um, disfigured men in um, Western history. Um, and uh, in the opening um, act of the play, 
Cooper comes onto the stage and stands in front of um, a picture of the actual um, John Merrick and slowly over the period of about three minutes um, begins to, without the use of makeup, makeup or prosthetics, to kind of like baroquely, ornamentally curl his body, reshape his body, restyle his body um, into a shape that audiences will recognize as that of John Merrick. Um, I wondered whether this performance was a fantasy of Cooper's or whether there was any kind of historical or rhetorical veracity in that technique. And as it turns out, um, in the uh, 1923 um, memoir published by Sir Frederick Treves, who was John Merrick's physician in the late 19th century, wrote the memoir um, several decades later, published the memoir several, several decades later, um, I, I find evidence that um, uh, that Trees was actually using precisely this technique in his treatment of his patient, kind of um, speaking to his patient about what it might be like to conceive of himself as an ornamental pattern design and what might that mean um, for his own thinking about and operation of, um, of his body. And I'm going to close here um, by reading a paragraph so you can kind of hear the language of the textile pattern kind of um, brought into the description of the man. The surgeon doesn't simply repaint, but remakes Merrick, describing him as a fresco or tile ornament. He explains how Merrick's human features are interwoven with anomalous vegetable and animal forms, emphasizing a brow whence, quote, projects a bony mass like a loaf, while from the back of the head hangs a bag of spongy, fungus-looking skin, the surface of which is comparable to brown cauliflower. Merrick's mouth is a pink stump, his, raw, a rut, his jaw a rudimentary trunk or tusk, his face a block of gnarled wood. He possesses cauliflower skin, a radish thumb, fingers of thick tuberous roots, a fin or paddle rather than a hand, and from his chest hangs a bag like a dewlap suspended from the neck of a lizard. Merrick is displaced from the genre of biological sketching or photography, um, which we see first on the stage before Cooper emerges, to Renaissance ornamental design or one of the Victorian textile patterns that might have formed part of a collection of designs owned by the Treves family upholstery business. Um, were there time I could talk about um, Treves' dual trainings as upholsterer um, and surgeon. Um, uh, there are a number of other aspects of this memoir, which I think has not been looked as um, looked at as uh, an example of what a trained upholsterer can kind of bring into um, the space of the medical examining room and how that kind of inorganic orientation of design thinking can be mobilized for helping a patient um, kind of rethink the, 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 the meanings and um, functions and um, forms of relation that his body um, might have in the world, but I think that this is a, a kind of potential um, fruitful space and one that ought to be um, further investigated. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to thank, first of all, um, Deborah Jensen and uh, Sarah Rogers and the entire staff at Duke and at the uh, Humanities, Humanities Institute for what's been a really uh, lovely um, conference. I was uh, uh, talking to some people previously, you know, so often we describe our work, or I describe my work, as uh, interdisciplinary, but it never really is interdisciplinary. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, a keyword. Um, but, you know, an event like this really is deeply interdisciplinary, and it's uh, um, really recharging um, to, to, to both see the different ways in which people are thinking and talking about a, same, uh, a set of shared issues, but also the overlaps between them to see how, how we, we think in common. Um, one of the great advantages of giving a paper near the, the end uh, of a conference is that you get to hear all of these uh, wonderful conversations that lead up to your panel and to imagine how your work uh, might, might fit with those. Um, of course, one of the great disadvantages of, of doing this is that uh, you constantly want to rewrite your paper on the fly. Um, so I'm not doing this today, but I've tried to pare my presentation down to what I see as some of the essential points of contact between my own interests and those of previous panelists. 
Um, so I'll take up my end of the conversation with a small observation uh, about the fact that much of the work in the medical and the health humanities seems to ask what the humanities bring um, to the health sciences. I share this sentiment wholeheartedly, and it's been a central intellectual uh, uh, tenet of mine since, the, since I started work like this. But today I'm offering a brief caution by way of describing how the humanities themselves are already shaped by and indebted to the legacies of imperial and colonial medicine. So when we want to intervene back into medicine from the field of humanities, we sort of think there's kind of like a feedback effect that we want to be attentive to and to, to, to think through. That is, any, in any event, has been the, the direction and the shape of my work over the past uh, couple of years. So I'm a literary critic and a historian of medicine, and we're going back in time uh, for, for this talk. Uh, what I do is I, I study the history of illness and of epidemic, and I try to identify the emergence of contagious diseases in specific populations, trace how those diseases spread from person to person, from town to town, and how public health measures either exacerbate the severity of those epidemics or help them eventually recede. Many of the historical illnesses that I write about, so smallpox, yellow fever, cholera, present um, such violent and affecting symptoms that I try to give audiences advance notice of what they might expect to hear um, or read in my, in my work. Uh, I'm not actually going to be talking about those illnesses today, but near the end of the talk, just to let you know, I will be quoting from descriptions of the psychological um, pain and distress suffered by enslaved persons being transported across the Atlantic Ocean. I'll wager that none of us really thinks of the disease that I'm talking about today, that is nostalgia, as a disease. Um, yeah, nostalgia, that sentimental longing for an idealized past which may or may not have ever existed, but which we imagine as a simpler, less fractious time. It's just a familiar uh, modern conception of nostalgia, but it is completely different from the original definition of the term, which was coined in 1688 by a Swiss physician named uh, Johannes Hofer to describe a painful and fatal form of homesickness. Um, as the word uh, nostalgia suggests, it combines the Greek root nostos, homecoming, and algos, pain. Um, this was a spatial or geographic disease rather than a temporal malaise. So there's a huge shift took place between the 18th century and the 19th century where nostalgia was, a spa again, a spatial condition, a dislocation, and became what we understand it to be as a temporal and also uh, aesthetic, uh, aesthetic condition. Um, uh, uh, so it was said, the nostalgia was said to affect young people in particular, students, soldiers, servants, who were separated from their homes and prevented from returning. The symptoms were diffuse. Uh, they included diminishment of the senses, decrease of strength, of hunger, thirst, heart palpitations, fitful sleep, and stupidity of the mind. Um, these are all sort of the, the, the contemporary uh, descriptions. Crucially. Um, the most important thing, I think, to, 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 one of the most important things to know about nostalgia is that there were no treatments for it. Medicine was ineffectual. Uh, the actual only preventative or only cure was to return a patient home. That's the only thing that could get them in the right uh, frame of mind um, to, to avoid death. So I'm actually going to, for today, I'm going to skip over what is really a fascinating history of 18th century nostalgia um, and the equally fascinating shift in nostalgia's definition from a spatial to a temporal condition so that I can turn part of my, uh, the part, turn to the, excuse me, <clears throat> turn to the part of my argument which is most congruent with this weekend's conference. I'll only say, to sketch out, that from between 1688 and 1750, nostalgia was an uncommon diagnosis. It was rarely, if ever, used and certainly not outside of Switzerland. So it was really a local Swiss illness for the first 60 years of its existence, uh, so the existence of the concept. Um, but from 1750 to the end of the 18th century, nostalgia grew, uh, uh, increased dramatically in popularity as French, German, and British military physicians adopted it to describe the high rates of mortality among soldiers and sailors who had been sent across the globe to defend their nation's imperial ambitions. Uh, this is a fact that has led historians to think of nostalgia as an imperial disease and as a pathology of movement. By the early 19th century, the military associations of nostalgia were so strong that it would be known in France as, quote, more common still than scurvy and no less deadly than typhus. It is one of the unhappiest aspects of the medical profession. <laughs> 
So the link between nostalgia um, and, colo and colonial diseases like scurvy and typhus would become increasingly important over the course of the 18th century. But the immediate sticking point for me um, in associating nostalgia and empire, so thinking of it as an imperial disease, is that it rests on the, on the ability of imperial power to represent itself as a transparent expression of the natural order. That is, the empire, it's the, the purpose of empire is to suggest this is the way the world is, this is the way the world works. Um, so to, to label nostalgia Nostalgia's history as imperial, based on the fact that the archival record uh, of the disease is overwhelmingly skewed toward observations and, uh, and, and evidence of military physicians, is to accept the record uh, produced by imperial agents, to accept the imperial, um, the, the imperial history as a full reflection of the historical past, rather than as a much narrower history of military medicine that it really is. So the influence of military medicine on the forms of late 18th century nostalgia is undeniable. I certainly won't deny it, but it does. But this th this fact doesn't preclude us from asking what the condition begins to look like, what nostalgia begins to look like, if we expand the historical narrative to include alternate names and forms of longing. So one of the things I want to do is I want to shift away and think about what it means to not think of nostalgia as an imperial disease, and actually to think of it as a colonial disease, which are both very closely related terms, obviously. But in the imperial setting, what I'm thinking here is in terms it's a, the sort of the military framework of it uh, of, of imperial expansion, whereas the colonial disease is much more rooted in local experiences of imperialism and the, the sort of the, 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 the reproduction of that uh, of, of the colony. And so there's a much closer relation between um, uh, between peoples, so that's to say Europeans, Creole people in the New World, but also African and indigenous persons. And so that's the, the shift that I'd like to look at. And so then to think of nostalgia, so when I talk about nostalgia, by the way, I don't, I, all I mean is this diagnostic uh, category. I rarely, if ever, use nostalgia in the sort of the the, the, vagal, the, the normal sense that we do in the 21st century. Um, so, so nostalgia is one condition uh, that is similar to an, a, a number of other forms of longing and homesickness in the 18th century that I'll be talking about. So given this sort of background, I'll make uh, a few observations and questions that arise from this the history. First, uh, observation. The archive of nostalgia is a military archive. The victims of the disease were soldiers, and the military physicians who observed it did so with an eye to facilitating the work of empire. So that is the, the, the base. Second, um, this military archive cannot possibly encapsulate all forms of homesickness and longing in the 18th century Atlantic world. Third, given that nostalgia eventually took on a temporal valence and an aesthetic category uh, in and around the Romantic era, I think it's worth asking what exactly our ignorance about its early medical history uh, obscures from our field of vision. What does it mean to talk about aesthetics and nostalgia in the 21st century if we forget that there is a colonial relation there uh, at, it, at, at, the root of this, uh, at the root of this history and at the root of these categories? Um, and, um, and, and, and finally, given that nostalgia was a disease of geographic dislocation, were enslaved Africans susceptible to nostalgia in the 18th century? This last question admittedly sounds odd. Um, but it's the question that's driven me to spend the better part of the last three years uh, reading the archives of military, colonial, and plantation medicine in search for traces of African nostalgia. It started off, I was surprised with the first uh, reference I saw to nostalgia in the colonial setting. I said, I didn't know this was a disease. Let me check this out. And you know, I read it. And, and the people who, who, when I first encountered it, it was mostly plantation physicians and military physicians um, who were referring to soldiers in the New World dying of nostalgia. So the immediate question I, 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 I was wondering is, do, do we see Africans being diagnosed with nostalgia? And initially, I didn't. I, I didn't see any. And so this became a, sort of an obsessive and really the worst kind of uh, archival search you can do is you're looking for something that's not there. And the moment you find it, your argument is gone. So far, lucky. Uh, <laughs> lucky is the wrong word. So far, uh, we haven't found it. So. Um, in contrast to well-defined historical illnesses like smallpox and the measles, nostalgia doesn't exist in any modern sense of the word. So how is a scholar um, to identify its presence in the record? You know, unless you see the word nostalgia there, um, you, you, it's going to be very difficult to identify, unlike, say, cholera or smallpox, which you could, you could, you could identify. What does one look for? Uh, is it possible to gather citations for an amorphous combination of thirst, hunger, sadness, stupidity, and death, and come to any reasonable conclusion about their medical significance in the 18th century, let alone the 21st? 
it is not. Um, indeed, this struggle represents what I think is as, of, as an intractable, pro intractable pro archival problem, which, if largely unacknowledged by historians and literary critics, nevertheless has a considerable distorting effect on the colonial record that descends to us. So this is an important fact that we don't see it, and I think it's worth thinking about why we don't. So to expand on this point further, any history of nostalgia that is indebted to the military physicians dedicated to protecting imperial interests of armies fighting over which countries would, con would control the world's most lucrative commercial route routes, no matter how thoroughly it catalog catalogs reports of disease and its treatments, and no matter how well it traces the evolution of the term, can only ever offer a very limited sketch of the relation between colonialism and displacement. Counterintuitive as it may seem, so long as nostalgia remains the analytic focus or the keyword uh, of any archival search, uh, 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 or, or, or archival search, a more expansive colonial silence will surround the historical pathologies of movement and dislocation in the Atlantic world. And I, I use the word, uh, the term silence here deliberately in relation to the archive, and I'm drawing obviously on, on the work of Michel Raftriot, who talks about the various moments of archival, uh, archival silence, right? They're, they're Famously, he talks about the four moments, the, the moment of fact creation, the moment of fact assembly, the moment of fact retrieval, and the, re retrospective sig the moment of retrospective significance or writing of history. Um, so so th that, th the shape of that framework, I think, is, is very productive for thinking about the history of nostalgia, which is not just a, a history of, 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 of a disease, but it's a history of memory as well. Um, so to come back to my central question, were enslaved Africans susceptible to nostalgia in the 18th century? The immediate answer to this question seems obvious, given the, that uh, the violence and forced dislocation of enslavement. But the answer becomes less obvious when divided into its component parts. First, did enslaved Africans um, exhibit the symptoms associated with nostalgia? And second, were enslaved Africans actually diagnosed with nostalgia in the 18th century? The distinction between what it means for an individual to experience the physical symptoms of an illness and for a professional physician to recognize each of those symptoms before aggregating them into a formal diagnosis is uh, an important one. The experience of the former does not automatically lead to the latter. In the abstract, it should come as no surprise that individual cases of illness may be overlooked or uh, misdiagnosed by physicians. But the structural failures that must take place for the profession to miss or to ignore the diagnosis of a disease among an entire population is on a different scale altogether. To recognize a diagnosis, physicians must look for meaningful symptoms, must understand those symptoms within a disease system, and must be familiar with a particular diagnostic category. For each of those steps to fail at once or in order is therefore, I think, historically and historiographically noteworthy. No matter whether the failure is intentional or unwitting, um, it means, among other things, that there's been a large-scale rhetorical and epistemological breakdown that makes it impossible to recognize specific diagnoses across populations. It means that some populations may not register as capable of suffering from specific illnesses, or that these illnesses may not be, uh, only be visible, or that these illnesses, excuse me, may, may, be on, may only be visible in certain populations, whether their effects are felt more broadly or not. This, obviously, I'm talking in specific uh, context of, of nostalgia in the 18th century, but this is a much uh, broader and continuing problem for, for, for medicine and public health uh, well into the, well, to, to, to today, in the 21st century. So I, I should clarify. I should clarify that uh, in asking about African nostalgia, I'm not interested in playing a game of retrospective archival diagnosis. My point is not to argue, is person X or population Y prone to nostalgia? It is rather to ask why we don't recognize X or Y as nostalgic in the first place. Why are they illegible? Why are we illiterate? What? In other words, uh, is the historiographic cost of accepting the imperial record of nostalgia at face value without inquiring into the relation of homesickness to the bodies of enslaved Africans and other colonized subjects? It's a question of literary, a literary critical question about the limits of narrative, for, uh, narrative form in accounting 
uh, sorry, for specific colonial rel relations and in the limits of analytic criticism in recognizing the broad valences of those forms. A question about how diagnostic categories are determined by colonial relations to home, nation, memory, and migration, and about how those relations determine what physicians see in their patients and how they write about these, uh, those observations. And finally, it's a question about how the reading practices scholars inherit from those acts shape our current critical vocabularies. What does it mean to write about nostalgia as a narrative or aesthetic mode in the 21st century if the very existence of those modes is predicated on silencing African longing in the slave trade? And perhaps thinking about that silence vis-a-vis -vis nostalgia helps us to further understand the supremacist roots of nostalgic populism in the contemporary political sphere. The short answer to questions about susceptibility of enslaved Africans to nostalgia is that neither Anglophone nor Francophone physicians diagnosed nostalgia in enslaved populations in any sustained or systematic way during the 18th century. It's not until the last half decade of the century that the possibility of such a diagnosis seems to even have been acknowledged in any real sense by the British, and only in the 19th century that the French appear to have done the same. This is not to say that enslaved Africans did not exhibit forms of longing and homesickness that seem almost indistinguishable to us from nostalgia. They did. Indeed, in 1729, British slave ship surgeon Thomas Aubrey uh, described the longing that recently enslaved Africans displayed uh, during the Middle Passage. They were troubled, Aubrey writes, with, quote, the sorrowful thoughts of quitting their own native country, friends, and relations, end quote. Um, though he doesn't use the term nostalgia, his remarks make it clear that slave trade physicians and surgeons were concerned with African forms of longing for at least as long as their military counterparts were interested in nostalgia. We can turn to the late 18th century uh, during the 1788 to 1790 uh, British parliamentary hearings on the slave trade and see witness after witness comment uh, similarly. Isaac Wilson, a surgeon in the Royal Navy, made, uh, um, described fixed melancholy, suicide, and general shipboard mortality among the ship's uh, African population during his testimony. John Hall, who served as a mate on two slaving voyages, attributed the general dejection to the enslaved being taken forcibly from their nearest and dearest connections and from their native country. Thomas Trotter would recall being awakened while he was on a, sh a ship surgeon, while uh, being awakened in the middle of the night by, quote, how a howling melancholy kind of noise, something expressive of extreme anguish occasioned by the enslaved finding themselves in a slave room after dreaming that they had been in their own country amongst their friends and relations. This exquisite degree of sensibility was particularly observable among the men, though among the women, excuse me, many of whom in these situations I found in violent fits. So, the diagnostic similarities are, are, are uncanny, but the word nostalgia never comes up. So what is the impulse that prevents a physician like Trotter from seeing and naming nostalgia in enslaved Africans? We could propose any number of uh, explanations. The most obvious one that we tend to jump to, that I've jumped to, and a lot of people talking to, uh, talked about this, is, that, is, that, um, is the failure to recognize the humanity of Africans. But uh, if the enslaved are not humans, that argument would go, um, they can have no affective desire for home and therefore cannot succumb to nostalgia. But that is wrong. It's, it's clearly wrong. Uh, all of the testimony indicates that witness after witness understood that forcible removal of home from friends and from family uh, was the same dislocation that produced uh, nostalgia in European soldiers, and that those were the affective triggers of melancholy and despondency amongst enslaved Africans. So I want to offer very quickly as I end an alternate possibility that has everything to do with the way that diseases are organized, named, and described. <laughs> In order to recognize a set of symptoms in a patient or in a population of patients, in order, that is, to imagine how those symptoms fit within a given diagnostic category, a physician must first acknowledge the mode of treatment that is indicated for the disease. As nostalgia's military observers noted, this meant that physicians had to acknowledge the possibility of returning a patient home before nostalgia could offer itself as a plausible, let alone probable, diagnosis. This is um, this even if the physician had no uh, intention of ever sending the patient home. So there's plenty of, of notes about like, all right, we're going to trick this patient. We're going to tell him we're going to send him home, but we're not going to. He'll get better and everything will be fine. Um, but if, as in the case of the slave trade, there were no conditions under which a physician or administrator could conceive of sending a patient home, a, diagnostic, a good diagnosis of nostalgia remained unimaginable. This inability to abstract from symptom to diagnosis is the silent fact that shapes the historical destiny of nostalgia and that would guide the orientations of home and memory in the literary history of the 18th century Atlantic world. So I will stop there. Thank you. Um, I have a specific question for Colby, and I guess I would invite the panel generally to maybe 
think about those questions or think about each other's talks. And so while I'm, while I'm putting you on the spot, um, you, I, I really loved what you set up about the connection or the what what it means to be um, using fashion and style in relation to what we would consider a diseased body, right? And what happens uh, both to the style part of it and to our perception of that body. There was a point at which I thought you were asking us to see the tumor differently. And I was both intrigued and concerned, right, about that. Because we don't, on the one hand, and I think about Octavia Butler talking about cancer as a gift, right? But cancer is a gift in a culture that can make it not an illness, right? That can learn from it. So we have that perspective, but it's also a horrible thing to happen to somebody. So how do you negotiate those that side of it? Um, what happens, in what ways um, are the designers you're looking at acknowledging the illness? And you know, in a way, saying to the, the person, you don't have to forego style because of your illness. But we don't want to forget the illness. So how do you think yeah. that? Well, I, 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 I'm actually less interested in designers who say you don't have to forego style because of your illness, which feels condescending right. and just right. bizarre to me. So it, last spring, okay. there was a, an exercise at um, Pratt that the senior fashion designers engaged yeah. in. Um, which was a pretty cool exercise in which they each of the designers was paired up with a, disa a disabled person and um, basically customized their runway show for that person and their disability. Um, I thought this was a, a very, um, uh, in some ways, a, a really cool thing, a really interesting thing, a really important thing, um, but it still kind of clung to the kind of like fundamental modernist aesthetic of utility yeah of the body and utility of the body's interface with structures around and on it um, in this like really kind of in, entrenched way. And, and what I would, was trying to get at and am trying to get at in the project is that there's something in style's kind of approach to excess and what style allows excess um, to mean to us um, that is qualitatively different from that, that other way of, of thinking and doing, and that is, is, is actually a, a really kind of important and potentially um, radical orientation. Um, so that's kind of piece, piece one of um, uh, my answer to your question. Um, piece two of my answer is that a lot of this project kind of came out of, of an experience of um, my own <laughs> Uh, three years ago when I had uh, pink eye in both of my eyes and simultaneously an allergic reaction to the medicines that I was putting on them, um, which made my face like swell horrifically. And it was, it was a supremely uncomfortable socially and physically um, experience. And it lasted for a really long time, um, like a, a period of a, a couple of months. And I had to figure out, um, like I wasn't sick enough to take sick leave. Um, uh, at work, I had to go and, as we all do, interface with students and colleagues, and it was really hard to kind of be in the world with this um, predicament. And um, the thing that sort of helped me through that period is that um, you know, I normally wear contact lenses, and I thought, what am I going to do with this? I, I went out and I, I found the biggest pair of horn rim glasses <laughs> that I could. I thought, well, all I can't hide it. The best I can do is like frame it, literally, um, <laughs> and I'm very, I'm completely blind, or you know, not completely, but uh, uh, my prescription is strong, and so it has the effect of actually amplifying what's um, behind, and I just was really interested in how much better I felt with this framed, amplified disfigurement on my face, because it was my opportunity to say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to orient and ask anyone who engages with me to orient themselves from a mindset of style which engages with excess in a qualitatively different way from what biological paradigms of health and normalcy um, and beauty or whatever ask us um, to engage with. And that actually didn't help the physical discomfort, discomfort, but it helped the emotional and social discomfort, and that was not trivial. <laughs> um, <laughs> So that, I guess the, the other piece of my answer is like, well, yeah, no, like it, 
a, a physical ailment and, and pain, you know, I don't, I'm not suggesting that style magically poof makes that go away, but I do think that these other pieces of sickness are, um, are, are, are huge and also need to be treated simultaneously. If I just push you a little bit though, you were talking about cancer tumors. Yeah. So that's a very different thing from, say, a di another kind of disability or a temporary condition. And I'm wondering if mortality mm -hmm. plays at all mm -hmm. into your analysis. Because mm -hmm. what we're talking about with a cancer tumor, if the image you were showing us was that, which mm -hmm. is a very mm -hmm. large one, particularly the, the um, I mean, I assume one of them was, whatever. Yeah. Um, is, is that a unique or different, does, are you thinking at all about the, these questions in relation to mortality? Yeah, I mean, obviously that's important. I actually don't know that these tumors are, the, the designers are nonspecific about okay. the tumors. So they're, they're really engaging explicitly with the, the surface okay. and form um, mm -hmm. of tumor, which, you know, but I, ta I take your point. Um, but I, I do think that there is a value to engage with the, visualization of the sick body at separately because nobody does it <laughs> um, it, it's not the it's not the like knee-jerk paradigmatic response of medical treatment and and I think that treating those aspects is is actually not a useless thing to do Thanks. <clears throat> Question is for uh, Christopher. Just, um, I'm curious about a year ago there was uh, a condition, and I haven't heard about it much since then, about immigrants in America suffering from what may be the flip side of what you talk about being sent back to their countries of origin and having fainting episodes and going around. And, and then there's a social construct. I don't know what the medical problems are really, but there's a social construct. It was there and it wasn't there. Yeah. People were wondering, is it really true or was this acting or what is it? It just struck me as kind of a, yeah. an inversion of the yeah. nostalgia thing, yeah. wanting to go back to your yeah. own country. And I wondered if that had occurred to you and how you might think about it. So that specific, uh, I had not heard of that specific uh, indication, but it's, um, it's quite interesting. I mean, part, part of the undercurrent that I didn't, oh, sorry, part of the under, is this working? Uh, the, the undercurrent that I, that I didn't talk about here is that relation, sort of the, the, the specific national condition, right? So not just home as the place where your family is, but as a, as a military, the, sort of the nation state. And this is very deeply related to history in the way that uh, um, Christina was talking about it, ben, uh, sort of Benjamin and, and progressivist history and historiography. It's an, an, another, um, uh, uh, com com component to this, but one of the things that's that's fascinating to me about about the disease of nostalgia in the 18th century, you talked about sort of the social construction. I mean, if we want to use that term to think about illness, that is the most socially constructed of all diseases because it it doesn't exist, right? It's a condition. It's it's a name used to describe a vague set of. Uh, a, a, a vague set of conditions, but what it does describe is what alienation and dislocation look like. And what it does describe is um, the way that we can talk about alienation and dislocation. So I think, uh, you know, if I think about that sort of being sent home as, a, as, as something that causes a pathological affect, I mean, there are sort of two ways to, to think about that. One is, is being um, taken away from, I'm, I'm assuming, is it from the United States? Is it? From the United States, well, so this is the perfect American or disease Europe. then, oh, or Europe. So it's the perfect Western disease because who would not want to be in America or the United States, and particularly in the last couple of years when the United States and America are are intent on not letting people come here, right? This continually reaffirms that notion of, of the West's, um, you know, the homeliness. Uh, right. Yeah, this um, this is. Uh, so, Christina's talk was just riveting and uh, gorgeous, um, and I want to actually make that connection with home in relation to uh, the body and, and suffering around the, the dislocations that you were making. Um, but in your, in your paradigm, and I think your detective work here is, is just peerless, and that this is really I would suggest that the term, um, the colonial medical term, metempsychosis, mm -hmm. 
which really means the transmigration of souls, yeah. which they used to describe slaves jumping overboard or committing suicide, mm -hmm. trying to go through that space of Ombadru, under the water, and returning to a kind of African afterlife. Mm -hmm. um, that that is sort of where they're seeing how nostalgia works yeah. in slaves. But, but the fact that, you know, I mean, as you know, I really looked for this too and did not find any of it, although I thought that I had mm -hmm. seen that. Um, in terms of the, the application of that term. It tells us so much about medicine yeah. and the need to have a, a therapy mm -hmm. that, that can be applied yeah. through the, the research. Um, and yeah, so, um, but also around home and the unsettling of all this. Think about the uncanny mm -hmm. and how much the uncanny has come up as, as a kind of bridging motif here. Um, the, the, the metempsychosis is, is really, this is sort of another part of the work that I've, that I've been thinking about, because that is tied not to nostalgia, but to, to melancholy. Yeah. So that nostalgia, um, you have to be sent home. That's the cure. Well, if you have man melancholy for enslaved persons, and if you believe, now this is, a, I, I'm sure, a European belief, an English belief about African beliefs. I'm not convinced that it's an African belief. But the, 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 um, if you believe that the African believes he or she will, will go home if, he, if, 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 if the person dies, then that becomes also a cure. It becomes a way to, to circle around. Um, nostalgia, because nostalgia, the, the nostalgias, nostalgics don't commit suicide, but melancholics do, and and the cure then is going home figuratively. So that's a thank you. That's a wonderful observation. This is a thank you to all the panelists. Um, this is another question or thought, I suppose, for Christopher. Um, it it occurred to me um, that the scenario in which you were setting up was more or less the mirror image of what happens with culture bound syndromes in the DSM-4. We don't still have culture bound syndromes anymore. They vanish in DSM-5. But the idea, for those of you who aren't aware of this part of the DSM, um, is that it's a lexicon of diseases that take place in non-English speaking or non-Western European parts of the world. And um, it runs about four pages. It's uh, in contrast to the 400 plus pages of the rest of the DSM-4. So all other cultures and non-English figurations of psychic diseases then become cataloged in these four pages. And many different countries are lumped together often under individual headings. Um, so you think, see things like Amok, and it talks about where Amok takes place and the different relations between it. Um, so my point with this is to say that if we arrive in the DSM-4 with a representation of diseases and locations that are highly specific and pointing towards a kind of otherness, you set out a paradigm which is epistemologically the opposite of that, in which one has to gain access to disease that is otherwise everywhere prevalent. Um, and I suppose this is simply more of a comment than a question I wonder what you make of that big epistemic shift, and if there's a kind of a bad faith then that's present in pointing towards all of these diseases that take place elsewhere, um, which papers over the nostalgia which people had, did not historically have access to. Wow. Well, the question of bad faith, I've been, I've, been, I've, I've been thinking about that a lot in relation to nostalgia specifically. And I think where I've come to is that it, it I mean, yes, it matters, but it also doesn't matter because what you describe is what's being described is actually is is um, um, is is is, a, is an, a cultural inability to recognize, right? And whether that that inability to recognize is in good faith or bad faith, it's still there. Now, that I, I want to step back from saying that the, the bad faith doesn't matter because obviously, on, in, in sort of in, in political terms, it. it uh, it does matter very, very importantly. But my, my sense in, in, the, in the 18th century is that it's not in bad faith at all. It's just uh, it, it's it representative of what of what not medicine but what medicines look like. Right? There's different professions. A surgeon is not a physician. A physi you know, it's, you go you, you go down the lines like that. Uh, in the 20th and 21st century, well, I think it was the, the t I'm trying to remember now which panel. Yeah, it, it was. Was it the, pan the on 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 the first day the panel about re uh, about respiration and, and, and breath about sort of it just not being able to um, 
uh, not recognizing, right? Not 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 seeing. Um, sorry, I just uh, slipped my, the point I was going to make. Um, uh, 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 just slipped my mind. But but across populations, these are just sort of well, they're not just, but they uh, but they're, they're reflections of, of not asking the right questions. We're not seeing what the questions might, not even seeing the condition of possibility of those questions. And that to me is where humanities is the most useful uh, as a partner with medicine. Thank you so much, I think, for time. Well, sorry, we'll have to just uh, end here. And uh, thank you so much.